Hello and welcome to our next module here in the class. And as you can see here on the first page, what we're going to be looking at in this module is uh, the treatment of workers in the modern American agricultural system. We're going to be focusing in particular on the treatment of workers in uh, the tomato industry, and in particular the tomato industry in Florida. Uh, we're going to do that because there's been a great deal of attention and debate about the treatment of uh, Florida's tomato workers in recent years. Uh, along with a, a best-selling book on the topic uh, and an example of um, some social justice uh, activism actually producing uh, real discernible benefits for the workers um, in that particular area. So it's uh, a particularly good example of some of the issues surrounding workers uh, and work in the modern American agricultural system. Uh, so we'll be looking at that and I'll be having you actually uh, listen to an interview uh, with that author a little later in the module. Uh, and really, I'll allow him to do uh, quite a bit of, really even most of the talking in this module, uh, because you can hear uh, from the horse's mouth, so to speak, what the issues are and um, how they've been started to be addressed uh, by some real uh, social activism there in the area. Uh, but. I wanted to give a little introduction first and then also have uh, some questions uh, and issues to raise from the particular perspective of Catholic social teaching in the class uh, a little later in the module as well. Uh, but obviously just to kind of bring us uh, up to speed and to think about how this fits into the class, we've been talking of course about 21st century American agriculture, which is defined really by that revolution that took place in the 20th century where agriculture went from these small traditional farms with lots of uh, intensive human labor by the individual farmers and maybe a few hired workers. And of course, over the uh, last century or so, or even more so over the last half century, uh, what has happened has been a transformation of that, where the farms have gotten fewer in number and much bigger in size, uh, and that a lot of the uh, manpower used in the production of food has been replaced with uh, capital and with technology, uh, with things like tractors and combines, and then also with uh, things like uh, artificial fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides uh, and all of those sorts of things. And so that this has meant there's been a real shift from uh, these kind of independent traditional farmers uh, to these much larger uh, farms, which aren't necessarily corporate, uh, they can still be family owned, uh, but it's much more on a kind of corporate model where uh, you really are concerned about uh, cash flows and, and capital expenditures. And it's really about optimizing your use of technology um, and optimizing your use of financing to really succeed as a farmer. Uh, and what has happened though, of course, is that there are still uh, times in the agricultural year, uh, and in, there are still particular crops where you do need uh, a lot of manpower, a lot of man hours uh, being applied. Um, some crops, say like wheat for example, this isn't so much an issue. Uh, you can use tractors and combines to pretty much do everything. Uh, with something like tomatoes though, there's no real effective way to harvest a, a tomato field mechanically. Uh, in part because the fruits are, uh, ripen at different times. Also just because of the nature of the fruit versus a hard grain. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, fruit and vegetable crops like this where uh, you still need uh, a lot of uh, manpower, man hours, at least at particular points uh, in the year. And this has created uh, the nature of uh, 21st century agriculture and 21st century agricultural labor is that um, there's not a lot of demand for any year-round labor. Uh, the shift has been towards seasonal, part-time, uh, temporary labor, and that is typically provided by uh, migrant farm workers or uh, who are also usually immigrants, either legal or illegal immigrants. And so um, these uh, migrant workers uh, will go from area to area to match the different uh, harvest periods uh, and work harvesting tomatoes and then 
who knows, cantaloupe or uh, greens or whatever it might be, it will go from place to place and try to put together a uh, living that way. Uh, and as you've probably heard, at least in some context or another, there's been a lot of uh, debate about this, a lot of questions raised about this in recent years. Uh, one of the reasons this came uh, back into the public consciousness a while uh, back was with the passing of uh, some of the stricter immigration laws uh, in the South. Uh, I forget which state it was precisely at the moment, uh, but a number of those states were considering laws uh, like New Mexico's strict immigration law. Uh, and there was actually a lot of protest from farmers in the state. Uh, and you might typically think of farmers as being uh, conservative uh, political types who would generally support strict immigration laws. Uh, but in this case, uh, the fear was that these strict laws would scare away uh, the migrant uh, workers that they needed to harvest their crops. And in fact, it did turn out uh, that way, that many crops were simply left to rot in the fields uh, because there weren't enough workers to uh, harvest them. And when they tried to hire um, from the traditional labor pool, nobody would take the jobs because they were uh, too difficult and didn't pay well enough. Uh, and so this is not just an issue in Florida for tomatoes. This is an issue uh, really across America uh, with all kinds of different crops, especially those that uh, don't lend themselves to mechanical harvesting. Um, and this is also a very important topic because uh, we're looking at lots of different uh, Catholic social teaching principles, stewardship of the land, subsidiarity, all those things. But if you'll recall, the foundation for all of that is the principle of human dignity, uh, that really everything is about preserving and promoting human dignity and allowing people uh, to lead lives that will ultimately be flourishing, where they can fulfill their potential, excuse me, where they can fulfill uh, their nature as a human person. Uh, so when we are looking at uh, ethical issues where the human dignity is being directly uh, attacked, directly violated, uh, that's a particularly uh, serious situation. This should be something that we are particularly concerned about if we accept uh, this Christian worldview, and we accept uh, the idea of the natural law or Catholic social teaching. Uh, and again, we're going to face a similar sort of debate here. Are we uh, aiming to maximize production and profit, or are we looking to promote these other goods, like the goods of workers, the good of the environment, and what have you? And do we, how do we strike a balance there? Uh, but again, we need to recall that it looks we're going to accept this Christian view of things, uh, our goal cannot just be to maximize profit. There needs to be profit to keep businesses running, but our goal should be uh, the good of everyone affected uh, by this industry, connected to them, whether it's the workers, the owners, the investors, the consumers, the communities, that we should be aiming for the good of the people first, uh, and then figuring out how to make a profit to make uh, that good doing possible if you will. Uh, so again, that's just an uh, introduction uh, to our topic here and why it's important. On the next page, I'm going to introduce you to the specific uh, controversy and issue surrounding uh, the production of tomatoes in Florida. Barry Estabrook is a, a journalist who originally wrote an article for Gourmet Magazine uh, looking at the production of tomatoes in Florida and some of the serious issues uh, he found with that production, both in terms of uh, environmental concerns, uh, and also the treatment of workers. Um, he went on to write a book about the issue, uh, and there was quite a bit of attention uh, given to the book uh, in the past several years, uh, and it has actually gone on to have a pretty significant impact on uh, the industry. Uh, and I thought it would be, as I said on the last page, a good uh, exemplary case for us to look at in regard to of the treatment of workers in modern American agriculture. Uh, and so you can see at the bottom of the page there, there's a link to an interview, a radio interview that uh, Estabrook did. Uh, it's about 37 minutes long, so I'm going to ask you to uh, listen to that as the majority of your uh, module for this week. And again, I think it's uh, a good thing, not that it just gets you out of my talking head for a while, although that's a good thing too. 
But it's going to give you, I think, uh, a very nice uh, example of a lot of the different issues that we've talked about uh, in regard to modern American agriculture. Uh, the first part of the interview, they really focus on uh, the issues of the environment and issues of uh, the quality of the product. If you recall, uh, he's a, a journalist who worked at Gourmet Magazine, uh, and it initially began uh, by focusing on the quality of the tomatoes uh, that were produced uh, there in Florida, and namely the fact that they weren't uh, very good, and he has a lot of complaints about those uh, that you can hear about in the interview. But I think one of the interesting things here uh, to note, along with the discussion of the different pesticides and herbicides and fungicides that he's going to talk about, and we've talked about some of the concerns raised by those uh, kinds of uses before, but I think one important thing to pay attention to um, is uh, to think about why tomatoes ended up this way, right? Why is it that you end up with all of these tomatoes that are uh, grown using all of these chemicals uh, and that are really kind of tasteless and hard uh, and really kind of unappealing as produce. Uh, and he basically explains that it's uh, a series of really kind of unintended consequences, that when the system is set up uh, to pay for uh, these industrially produced tomatoes, uh, the growers get paid by the pound. Uh, and so the growers want to maximize uh, pounds per acre, basically. Uh, and so if that is your goal, then you're going to buy seeds that are going to produce plants that are going to yield the most pounds of tomatoes uh, possible per acre. And the seed providers are going to uh, try to breed varieties of tomatoes that are going to do just that. They're going to maximize uh, pounds per acre. And so the net result of all of this is you're going to end up with tomatoes uh, whose main quality is uh, weighing a lot and having a lot of weight of tomatoes per plant per acre. Um, now, nobody set out to say, let's make sure these tomatoes don't taste very good. Um, but because of the way the system is set up, that's going to be uh, one of the results. And again, I think this is a good indication of how uh, social teaching works, how social systems work, that you can have a system where individual choices seem to make sense. Nobody sets out to do something immoral. But when we step back and look at the net results of how the system works, uh, oftentimes it can be uh, much more problematic than we would have thought. Again, back to the example uh, before about tractors. Nobody set out uh, when making the tractor to say, let's drive most farmers out of business. But in fact, that's ultimately what happens with the advent of tractors and combines and so on. And the same thing happens here. Uh, in connection with how uh, big wholesalers and restaurants and, and stores purchase their tomatoes. Uh, and of course, again, uh, one of the things that Brook will talk about here, uh, and one of the things that he focuses on in his work as a whole, is the role of consumer choice in all of this. That if you want uh, fresh tomatoes available year-round uh, while you live in New Hampshire or in Kansas, um, there's a limited number of ways that that's going to be possible. Now, you can grow them in greenhouses, but that's going to be pretty expensive usually. Or you can produce them uh, using some of the methods that he's going to talk about. And so uh, the consumer demand for fresh tomatoes year-round uh, is going to drive somebody to provide those tomatoes. Uh, whether or not that can be done in a way that uh, really is in keeping with the nature of tomatoes, uh, and whether it can be done in a way that is going to be for the benefit of the people involved in the production of the tomatoes, namely the workers. So those are some things I think to pay attention to, uh, particularly in that first part of the interview. Uh, and then in the latter part of the interview, uh, they're going to shift to this focus on workers. Uh, and Estabrook uh, will talk about some of the appalling conditions uh, that workers experienced, uh, especially prior to um, prior to his work and prior to their formation of basically what is a labor union. It's called the Coalition of the Milwaukee Workers, uh, which is this coalition of uh, tomato workers there in that community in Florida, and where they basically strike in order to get better conditions. Uh, and they go a step further and not just strike, uh, staying out of work, they actually go and protest 
um, and protest the companies that purchase the tomatoes. So they don't uh, protest, um, you know, corporate Florida tomato growers, uh, because frankly, corporate tomato growers in Florida don't really care all that much about public opinion. Yes, you know, they don't want to be seen as villains, uh, but not a lot of people really have a brand in mind when they go to buy a tomato at the grocery store. However, if you're somebody like Taco Bell, for example, uh, you do very much have a corporate image that you are uh, very keen to protect. And so if the workers go and protest Taco Bell uh, and put enough pressure on Taco Bell, Taco Bell will in turn tell its suppliers uh, to change their practices so that they can say that they are in fact uh, not supporting uh, these immoral labor practices and are promoting and purchasing uh, fairly produced products. And so it's a very nice, I think, example of what kind of things are possible uh, when we really uh, work for these principles of Catholic social teaching. And you'll see again in the interview, or here I suppose, in the interview, that it's not just, um, it's not just pay that's an issue, although of course pay is an issue, and they get the price for their tomatoes or they're paid for the tomatoes raised one cent um, a pound, which doesn't sound like much, but as they'll explain, is significant. Uh, but it's also other issues like worker safety, uh, like having some basic comforts and amenities available while they work, um, and, and overall quality of life. Obviously, there's some extreme examples brought up here of virtual slavery, um, which is illegal to begin. Uh, but there is more to the right treatment of workers uh, than just paying them enough. And that's an important thing, I think, uh, to pay attention to in listening to uh, this interview. And I think, as you hear kind of the conditions there, uh, you would hopefully agree that even if they were paid uh, very well, uh, forcing people to work or asking anyone to work in the kind of conditions that they endured would be immoral, really, regardless of what you were paying them. Uh, and then finally, again, as I mentioned before, um, obviously, this is an extreme example, right? That's why it became a best-selling book, why it received all this attention. Um, but it's also important to recognize that this may be one of the more extreme examples of what goes on. Uh, it's certainly not uh, unique that there are very similar issues uh, in a whole host of agricultural uh, industries uh, where there's a lot of use of migrant labor. Uh, if we wanted to uh, make this a little more specific to us here in Kansas, uh, we could look at uh, the use of migrant immigrant labor in a meatpacking industry, where uh, there's been a number of investigations and uh, news reports and federal uh, indictments uh, where basically they bus in illegal immigrants to these big meatpacking plants. Uh, make them work in appalling conditions for very little pay. They live in appalling conditions. Uh, and then eventually when they get busted by uh, immigration, uh, they simply truck in uh, another round of workers. So this is certainly not unique uh, to tomatoes, and it's certainly not unique to Florida. We have some of the same issues here in Kansas, which of course, hopefully, uh, after listening to this interview and then finishing the module and then doing a little reading, will uh, make us all reflect a little bit on our own uh, purchases and our own role uh, in this agricultural system. Hopefully you've had a chance now to listen to the Estabrook interview, uh, and he brings up a lot of issues that obviously are going to fall within uh, Catholic social teaching, although he doesn't necessarily use the terminology of Catholic social teaching. Uh, the principles are there, the same concerns are there, but I did want to make sure that I uh, provided you with some of the specific material from Catholic social teaching and the Catholic social teaching tradition that deals with uh, the dignity of work and the rights of workers, because that is a major part of Catholic social teaching. If you'll remember back to the module where I uh, introduced Catholic social teaching, you might recall that really it came into existence as a specific school of thought, a specific sort of a body of ideas in the late 1800s with the rise of industrialization. Uh, and that was really um, obviously a major change in uh, society. It also produced some particular problems that needed to be addressed. 
Uh, and those problems were uh, really a major shift in the relationship between uh, labor and capital, between um, average workers and the people who control uh, the means of production, the machinery, the land, uh, and those sorts of things. And what ended up happening uh, in that Industrial Revolution was really the mistreatment of and um, degradation of many of the workers in, in horrible conditions, very little pay, uh, simply because the balance of power had shifted so much to uh, the capital, to the owners. So Catholic social teaching was meant to uh, address that, and then it grew uh, beyond that to deal with all kinds of issues uh, related to the poor and marginalized in society. Uh, but in 21st century America, you know, we don't have uh, a lot of sweatshops. We don't have a lot of child labor in factories. But we do still have situations where uh, we have workers who work in very difficult conditions, uh, who are paid very little, uh, and who have very few rights. Uh, in this case, because many of them are uh, illegal immigrants and don't um, don't feel comfortable going to uh, law enforcement or to other government agencies to argue for their rights as workers. Uh, and so I think Catholic social teaching is very much applicable uh, to the role of workers in agriculture uh, here in America today. And I'm going to give you on Blackboard a link to uh, an official church document called the Compendium of Catholic Social Teaching. Um, in particular, there's a chapter in there dealing with work from the perspective of Catholic social teaching. So I'm going to ask you to read that as our reading for this uh, module. And I just wanted to point out some of the key ideas from the reading because, again, uh, if you've ever read official church documents before, they can uh, sometimes be a little uh, difficult to get into and to, to pick out the big idea, so I wanted to make sure I emphasize those for you here so that we would hopefully make the reading a little clearer as you work through it. Uh, but again, to go back to one of the basic points that we've made before about business, and that's going to be behind um, what you read there in the compendium, is this idea of what is our ultimate goal, right? What is our ultimate goal? Well, our ultimate goal in everything uh, ought to be the true good of human persons. Right? They're true flourishing as individuals and as parts of families and society. Uh, and so when we're in business, whatever business it might be, that should be our goal. How do we help our employees? How do we help our customers? How do we help those in our community? That should be the first thing we aim to do. Uh, that's going to include then uh, recognizing and valuing and respecting the human dignity of all of those people, including the human dignity of our workers. This does not, of course, mean that everybody is exactly the same. The guy picking the tomatoes doesn't necessarily have to make the same salary as the owner of uh, the farm. However, uh, he needs to be treated in a way that recognizes his dignity as another person uh, and not just as an object, not just as a uh, sort of picking machine, if you will, that we could replace if we could find a more efficient model. Uh, what does this mean? Well, this means a lot of different things. One of the key things it's going to mean is if we're going to really respect this person's dignity, we have to pay them uh, what is often called a living wage or a just wage. That is, we need to pay this person enough uh, money to maintain their basic dignity so that they can provide uh, basic food, clothing, and shelter uh, for themselves and for their family. Uh, why, why is this necessary? Well, look, if we demand full-time labor from a person and don't pay them enough to maintain this kind of basic level of human dignity, we aren't really treating them as a person. We are uh, setting them up, putting them in a position where they are inevitably going to be degraded as a person, and they're not going to be able to uh, flourish. They may not even be able to survive long term and sort of that's this situation. So if we are asking full-time labor from this person, uh, then we need to provide a living wage for them and their family. Now again, that's going to vary on time and place and all kinds of other things, uh, but it still needs to be there however it, it, it gets worked out. Obviously we're going to need to protect the safety of the workers, um, 
obviously in those early factories that was a big issue with people being severely injured or killed uh, in the machines. Uh, in the instance of tomatoes here, uh, probably more of the issue is going to be in terms of the chemicals that all of these workers are exposed to that Esther Brooke talks about. Uh, we're also going to have to do other things that are going to allow these workers to lead dignified lives where they have a chance to flourish. So we need to pay them sufficiently, we need to keep them safe. We also need to have policies that allow them to have lives where they can have time off, where they can have sick leave, where they can have uh, family leave, uh, again. So those sorts of things need to be provided. Um, but we also want to uh, keep in mind the dignity of work itself. Right? And again, if you will think back to those first modules, uh, human beings, from a Christian perspective, are made in the image of God. Uh, and part of what that means is that we are sharers in his creative work. That we are meant to create things, to do things, to be productive, uh, and to find some of our meaning and fulfillment in life through those activities. Uh, and so for many of us, that's going to happen primarily in our work. Now we're going to need that work to be paid so that we can provide for our basic needs for ourselves and our families. But we also should, in our work, find some of that fulfillment. Now again, does this mean that every possible job is going to be one that people would just choose to do uh, if you ask them what their dream job would be? Well, no. No, that doesn't, that's not really realistic. Perhaps in heaven uh, that will be the case, but in the real world that's probably not going to happen. But it doesn't need to be a person's dream job for them to be able to find fulfillment in it. Uh, you might just have opportunities for them to change what they're doing, so they're not doing the same task over and over again, day after day. Perhaps you figure out a way to bring in some variety. Perhaps you allow uh, the workers some participation and decisions about how work is done. Uh, allow them uh, a chance to innovate, to do things differently, to do things better. Uh, and we probably all had experiences where we were doing something we wouldn't necessarily have chosen to do, but we did it really well, or we figured out a better way to do it. And that can bring a sense of satisfaction that should be part of uh, working life for everyone. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, one of the things to conclude with here, uh, this can seem like a lot. It can seem very difficult to imagine how you could stay in business in the competitive 21st century world, paying workers uh, so much, uh, providing good environment for them, uh, allowing them to find this fulfillment, even if it's going to diminish efficiency a bit. Um, but Really, that's all necessary if we're really going to respect the human dignity of people. And ultimately, when it gets down to it, uh, if there's no way to do these things uh, and still stay in business, well then, uh, ultimately, we're going to have to say, uh, I suppose we can't stay in business. We can't do something immoral that is treat a human being as just an object if that's the only way for us to stay in business because then our business is immoral. Uh, you know, if I was running, uh, you know, a photography magazine um, and producing nice, tasteful pictures for magazines, and as it turned out, as the industry evolved, if the only way for me to stay competitive as a photographer or as a magazine producer was to start to uh, shift over into pornography, um, it wouldn't matter even if I could pay uh, the model sufficiently, um, that would become at some point an immoral way to make a living, where I am essentially objectifying a person in order to make my living. Uh, and yes, it might seem drastic to say I'm going to have to close my business, uh, people will lose jobs, uh, what have you. But at a certain point, uh, if we're going to take the idea of natural law seriously, of capital social teaching seriously, of human dignity seriously, that might be what we are forced to do. And now, in many cases, there's going to be lots of things that we can do before we get there. There can be ways to share the profits a bit more uh, with labor instead of just capital. Uh, so, uh, those are some of the big ideas from a Catholic social teaching perspective that would be applicable to this issue of the tomatoes, uh, and which I will also ask you for your thoughts on on the discussion board. Uh, so since you're listening to quite a bit of that interview, uh, I will wrap up my comments from now and then we can continue our discussion uh, online.